All right. So this morning, we are continuing our study on what it means to grow in our walk with Jesus. Um, we began this study about two weeks ago, and we've just been looking at what does it mean for us to grow in our faith? What does it mean for us to mature? I said a few weeks ago that the number one question that I was asked by you guys over the last six months was, am I growing? Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Am I growing in my walk with Jesus? And so as we look into this study, it's, um, it's, we're going from one passage to the next. Um, we're in different passages of Scripture. We're not doing what we normally do, going through books of the Bible, but we're just studying what it means to go. A couple weeks ago, we looked at um, the, the best news ever, why, um, why we can grow, why the gospel has transformed us, what the gospel has done to impact us, to change us. And last week, we saw that we were created to grow, that we were designed by God to grow, that God desires for us to be growing as in our walk with Jesus and in life, that he desires that of us, that that's his longing for us. By the way, um, we send out discussion questions with the sermon notes on Monday morning, and so if you're not on our email list, please um, shoot me an email, sam at, sam at com, and I will make sure that you are on our email list so that you can get the discussion questions that are being um, with, this, um, with this series as well. You know, our church, as diverse as we are, um, especially um, folks in here, we come from all different church backgrounds. I mean, if we just started thinking through just denominational backgrounds, I mean, that's a pretty diverse community that we have, even in that context. And so some of what I say this morning, you might relate with. And for others of you, this will sound like it's absolute Greek. You're like, you guys grew up like that? That is really, really weird. There's some of you that grew up in church that took God very seriously. And, and I don't mean that in the positive sense. I mean that you might have been allowed to have a little fun in life, but when it came to God, life was serious and you changed your demeanor completely, right? You laughed out there, but you came in here and you, it was almost like you put a frown on your face because you were standing in front of a holy God and your demeanor completely changed. There were times in my life where I thought that God was only interested in things like my prayer life or how much I went to church or how much scripture I read or things like that. And almost a sense that my spiritual life was otherworldly. It was part of a different thing, but God didn't really care about the day-to-day -day things that I did. I thought a good Christian was focused on spiritual things and that other things like parenting or working or playing or resting really didn't matter to God at all. Those were secondary things to God. Those were things that a really spiritual person really invested time or energy into. I was under the impression that the more holy I was, the less I would care about these other things. And the image of spirituality that I had couldn't have been any more uglier. It was serious. It was otherworldly. It was less interested in the everyday things of life. And as a result, it translated into a wrong understanding of what growing in Jesus meant. It meant three things for me. Number one, spiritual growth is what was about being less human. It was about not investing in things of this world, but more just spending time with the things of God. It was about being more serious, and it, was involved, it, was, it also meant denying my desires. And the older I grew, the less attractive spiritual growth came, became for me. I still wanted to do the right things, but I wanted to do them because I knew that if I did the bad things, God would judge me and punish me, and I didn't want God to send like a lightning bolt and strike me down, right? And so I was more worried about just making sure I was doing the right thing so that God would bless me. And in the midst of it, I lost the joy of following Jesus. And I don't know if that's some of you this morning. You're here and you're saying, what am I doing? Am I doing enough? Am I doing the right things? And in the midst of that, you've lost the joy of pursuing Jesus. And I couldn't have been more wrong when it comes to spiritual growth. Growth isn't about white-knuckling it into sainthood. Scripture actually teaches that growth is about, all about a person that becomes fully alive in Jesus. It means enjoying God and enjoying life in deeper and more abundant ways, even in the midst of challenges 
and difficulties. It transforms our desires rather than denying them. And spiritual growth is the pursuit of God and the pursuit of joy. It's the happiest and the best place that we can be. I want to look at Matthew 22 as we think about what growth is and what growth isn't. I want to look at verse 34 down to verse 37, just a small passage, but a very familiar passage for those of us who grew up in the church. A Pharisee, a religious leader, heard that Jesus had silenced, I'm at verse 34, the Sadducees, and they came together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked a question to test him. He said, teacher, which command in the law is the greatest? And Jesus said to him, love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And all the laws and the prophets depend on these two commandments. So here's this guy, this lawyer, this religious leader, this um, person of key influence comes to Jesus to basically trap Jesus. They're trying to trap him. They're trying to discredit the ministry of Jesus. And here's the question they ask. They says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Great question, right? Which is, what are the things I need to be doing? What are the things that I'm supposed to be doing? Am I doing the right things? Am I doing enough? Am I doing the things that God wants so that God would accept me? See, you and I, we have this bad impression of the Pharisees. But remember, these were the spiritual leaders of the day. They wanted to do everything possible to make sure that they were obeying God. But the problem was that they were so serious with God that they made rule after rule after rule of the things that you could do and you couldn't do, that in the process, they also lost the joy in pursuing God. And now this Pharisee wants to come and says, am I doing enough? Am I doing the right things? And he wants to know what's more important. See, for the Pharisees, they ended up writing about 613 different commandments. That's a, and there was, that's a lot of laws to remember, right? Um, and there was this massive debate during that time of what was the most important. They thought that every commandment was serious, but you couldn't break any of them. But there were surely there were some commandments that were more important than other commandments, right? There were some sins that were not as bad as some other sins. And surely they, these things were weighted. And so what's the greatest commandment? And so they got there and they thought Jesus was going to say maybe one of the Ten Commandments, maybe even the first commandment that God was a serious, holy God. And so we need to be serious about not breaking these rules. And these rules have nothing to do with our desires or wants. And so we just follow rules. To be honest, it's easier to think that sin is fun and that spiritual growth is unpleasant. We think that sinners live it up while godly people live boring lives, don't we? I mean, think about the word that we use when we talk about the practices of our faith, spiritual disciplines. Ask my five-year-old what he thinks when he hears the word discipline, right? I mean, it's not a pleasant thought. And so we have this idea of pursuing Jesus as boring and hard. And hopefully one day when I make it to heaven, I'll get to enjoy all of this. But pursuing sin and pleasure is enjoyable. It's fun. And yeah, maybe one day, years down the line, I'll deal with the consequences of it. But right now, it's fun. Sin can be fun. But the fun is short-lived and ultimately destructive. Sin promises a good life, but it never delivers on the joy that it dangles in front of you. According to the Bible, sin is coercive, and it destroys everything that it touches. Sin kills. Sin interferes with the ways that things were supposed to be. It's destroyed the conditions of flourishing that God designed for the world and everything in it. In the beginning, the scriptures introduced us to a world that was good, that was created by God. And in chapter 3 of Genesis, humanity rebels against God, resulting in broken relationships, broken human relationship, a loss of intimacy with God, difficulty and aggravation in carrying out the roles that we have. There's physical death. There's so much more. 
And the next chapters of the Bible illustrate how quickly things begin to deteriorate, things begin to fall apart. It's a depressing, depressing and realistic depiction of the effects of sin that ruin and destroy our world. And the fallout was extensive. Sin corrupted everything, beginning with us and extending to our relationships, our bodies, our work, and the nature itself. Nothing is the way that it was supposed to be. Sin promises, but it can never deliver. It always lies. Sin is enticing because we think it will give us what we want, but it always leaves us unsatisfied. Even worse, it destroys everything that it touches. We're made to grow. We're made to flourish. We're made to increase in our love and pursuit of God. But sin has led to the loss of the world we want to live in. And yet spiritual growth is the exact opposite. It doesn't destroy. It gives life. God is in the business of restoring our humanity, giving us more joy, renovating our desires. And notice how Jesus answers this religious leader. He says, you shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Now I need to answer this question first. I want to answer the question of what it love is. Because love in our culture is a word that's used for everything, right? I mean, already this morning, you have probably talked about how you love your spouse, how you love your children, and how you love some kind of food or another, right? You love it, right? Um, I love, there, because we, we have no other way to communicate something that we really, really like. I love football. I love fajitas. I love children. And if you try to hear these sentences, you have no idea what you love more over the others because you love everything, right? Um, gosh, I love my kids. We need to find what we're talking about love, but specifically when it talks about loving God more than anything else. Love for God is delighting in God. It's a desire to know God. It's a desire to be with God. It's so simple. It's so straightforward. It's delighting in him and desiring to know him and to be with him. And when the text says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, what I'm trying to communicate and what I think the text is trying to communicate is that with your heart you want to delight in, you want to desire in, you want to pursue, you want to run toward. You don't want to turn away, you want to run toward God. And as we turn to God, the impact of it on our daily life has several implications. First of all, it means that our humanity is restored. Spiritual growth isn't about becoming less human. It's about God restoring us and the world to what it should be. I used to think that God only cared about certain things about my life. My prayer life was important to God. My Church was important to God. My scripture reading was important to God. But I couldn't figure out what God thought about the rest of it, about the rest of my life. Are we supposed to endure working Monday through Friday simply so that we can make it to Sunday to be at church, to be with God? It seemed like spiritual growth had nothing to do with things like going to school or paying bills or parenting or being a good husband. God was a part of my life, the most important part. And then there was everything else. And one day I read a sentence by this monk named Brother Lawrence who served in a monastery in the 1600s. And he wrote these words. He said, I flip my little omelets in the frying pan for the love of God. I flip my omelet in a frying pan for the love of God. And that one sentence startled me. This man didn't see that there was a difference between cooking and loving Jesus. All of it fit together. His whole life mattered to God. And then I found this verse in Scripture that later became my life verse, whatever you do, whether you eat or you drink, do it for the glory of God. You guys know I love to eat. And so when I found that verse, it was like, man, God is just confirming what I love to do, right? Whatever you do, something as mundane as eating. 
something as mundane as drinking. I probably drank like four cups of water this morning. Something as mundane as that. God says, I'm supposed to do it for his glory. That those things matter to God. That what I, how I eat matters to God. Notice how much of the Bible is about ordinary life. It's about eating. Things like working, things like marriage, things like parenting. That God cares about our world, not just church, not just the spiritual things we do, but about everything. That God doesn't want us to separate our spiritual growth from the rest of life. He wants it all. And that's my prayer in this series is that as we talk about how you grow, that it doesn't just talk about how you do more spiritual things, but how it impacts how you work. It impacts how you parent. It impacts how you are a good husband and a good wife, how you uh, relate in your campus, that you mature as a follower of Jesus that impacts your life. God cares so much about this world that he plans to restore it. Often we miss that our future isn't heaven. Our future is that heaven is coming to earth. Revelation says it this way, I saw a new heaven, a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth passed away. The sea was no more. And I saw a city, a holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And the best part of it is that God says in Revelation 21 that he is going to leave heaven and come and live with us. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be their God. We will have resurrected bodies. We won't escape living in our bodies on this earth. Instead, we'll finally enjoy living on earth as humans the way that God has created us. That means that God deeply cares about the world we live in right now. He cares so much that he's put you in that world. He's put you in the jobs that he's placed you in. He's put you in the campuses that he's put you in because he cares about that, those places. Even more, he cares about you. God's intent for you is the restoration of all things, including our humanity. Sin began with two individuals and it spread like a wildfire across all the world. And similarly, God restores the world by restoring people, individuals first. But he intends to do so much more. He will one day restore everything. The world will once again be what he intended it to be, only better. So the earth matters. Our world matters. We're meant to enjoy it. There's a song that we sang when we were growing up that said, the world is not our home. We're only passing through. That sounds like a great song, and I know what their meaning is, but it's not true. One day, there's going to be a new earth and a new heaven, and this is exactly where God intends for us to be. God doesn't plan to just snatch us away from earth to live in heaven forever. His plan is that we would live in our resurrected bodies, in his restored world, in his presence. God's plan isn't to destroy the world so that we could escape the world. It's to recreate the world so that you and I can live it and enjoy it. We're designed, my friends, to be worldly saints. That's what God has called us to be. Spiritual growth isn't us escaping from the world. It's recovering who we are so that we can be an impact in the world. It's longing for and praying for the restoration of all things. It's about becoming more human as we move closer to Jesus' original intent for us. Friends, God cares about every aspect of our lives. He's not just interested in what you do on a Sunday morning. He cares about who we are at school, at work, in our homes, when we're driving down 75 in coffee shops and restaurants. In every moment of our lives, God cares. And God desires to be involved in it. There's no such thing as a Christian life that's detached from our recreation or our mundane or our work life. All of it belongs to God. And the purpose of our lives isn't for us to become otherworldly, living on this earth, but only thinking about heaven. The purpose is that we would flourish in this world, the world that God has created. 
It's to fulfill our roles within this world to love God, to serve others, to cultivate the earth through our work, and to rest. I love that this picture of spiritual growth is more, is so much better than the one that I had growing up. That God cares about our lives. He cares about our world. He's restoring our lives, and he's going to one day restore the world to what it's meant to be. Spiritual growth is all about life. It's about all of our life. Secondly, it means that God wants to restore our joy. God doesn't want to just restore our humanity. He also wants to restore our joy. Friends, God is so committed to our joy. God doesn't just tolerate our joy. It is the heart of what God intends for us. The psalmist writes in Psalm 16, he says, You make known to me the paths of life. Your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. And this theme repeats throughout Scripture. In Psalms 4, he says, You put more joy in my heart than they have when they have wine and grain abound. When God's people were returning from exile, God speaks to the servants Ezra and Nehemiah, and he tells the people, hey, don't be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The church in the New Testament in Acts 8 says, the church grew and is portrayed as a spread of joy in the community. And Jesus, before he was taken from this earth, he told his followers before going to the cross, he said, these things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. That your joy may be full. Listen, as followers of Jesus, God desires that we be joyful people. I remember getting caught up in catechisms and reading the Westminster Catechism. The first question in the Westminster Catechism is, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever, was the answer. The first part of that answer I had no problem with. That made sense. Glorify God? Absolutely, I can do that. Enjoy him forever? What does that mean? That sounds a little selfish, right? I seem to think that holiness and joy were these inverse relationship. The more holy, the less joy. The more joy, the less holy. Friends, joy and holiness go together. God intends to restore our joy. Joy isn't peripheral to what God desires for us Contrary to what you think, it is the heart of God's design, and it's central to our growth. As C.S. Lewis quipped, joy is the serious business of heaven. Joy is the serious business of heaven. Maybe you wondered if joy is something different from happiness. Maybe God wants us to be joyful, but that's something completely different from being happy. Randy Alcorn is a phenomenal Christian theologian and writer, and he's written some incredible books on heaven and on money, and he wrote this book on happiness. And in this book, he studies scripture after scripture, studies church history, and he concluded that the distinction that some make between happiness and joy is unfounded. He said, I'm convinced that there's no biblical or historical basis that exists to define happiness as inherently sinful. Modern distinctions between happiness and joy are completely counterintuitive. For too long, we've distanced the gospel from what God created us to desire and what he desires for us, which is happiness. And as followers of Jesus, we need to reverse the trend. Let's redeem the world's happiness in light of Scripture and history. Our message shouldn't be, don't seek out happiness, but it should be, when you seek Jesus, you will find true happiness. God desires our happiness. God desires our holiness. Our problem is that we think that happiness is living life our own way. We resist God's way of holiness because it seems too constraining and too uncomfortable. And then we wonder why we're not happy as we expected. Friends, to pursue God is to pursue happiness. In the end, the pursuit of God and the pursuit of happiness are the same thing. There is nothing more satisfying than God. And ironically, you don't find happiness by seeking happiness. You find happiness by seeking God. You don't just get happiness on your own terms. You get it by seeking God. 
Remember, Satan tempted Jesus with the perfect life, with resources, with power, with approval, but it was on his terms. These were the same temptations that Satan has been dangling in front of us our entire lives. Jesus passed the test that you and I often fail. He showed us that the good life is found in following a different path, a path that says he who loses his life will save it, but he who saves his life will lose it. His obedience is then credited to you and I, and he gives us the example to follow. We don't find happiness in pursuing happiness. We find happiness by abandoning our lives in the pursuit of God. Paradoxically, the happiest husbands are the ones who pursue the happiness of their wives. Men say amen. The happiest leaders are more concerned with serving others than their own status or position. The happiest Christians are those who have stopped living for themselves because they've consu- they're consumed by how they can live their lives for God's glory. Enjoy your life. Savor your food. It's okay. Cheer when your team wins. Go Eagles. Laugh with your friends. Go for a walk. Enjoy the fresh air. There is nothing better for a person than what he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his work because this also is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat and who can enjoy life? As you enjoy these things, as you enjoy life, Treasure God as your greatest joy. While we live for him, he allows us to enjoy his gifts in this world while holding on to the lasting source of joy that will sustain us through difficulty. We can enjoy the world's blessings when we're not living for them, but when we're living for God instead. The third thing is that God begins to transform our desires. Our desires lie at the core of our being. Simply put, we want We're desiring creatures. Every action that you and I take is shaped by the pursuit of something we want. And the Bible is very clear about this. It traces our actions, good and bad, to our hearts, the motivational center of our being. That's why in Proverbs it says, above everything else, guard your heart, for because out of it flows the wellsprings of life. Jesus in the Gospels diagnosed our problems and he said, From our hearts comes all wickedness, all evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality. He says all of that comes from your heart. The theme of desire runs throughout. and obey them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. See, until God gives them a new heart, it is impossible for them to obey. Once God gives his people a new heart, they'll want to obey. God promises to write the laws on their heart so that everyone from the least to the greatest will know him. Listen, friends, God isn't just interested in grudging obedience by guilt or by obligation or you saying, hey, how much is enough so that God would accept me? He isn't interested in just external compliance or religious performance. He wants you to want him sincerely. He wants your complete and unreserved love. He makes this possible by changing us, by giving us new hearts. God wants us most. What God wants most is for us to want him. The problem is you and I, we set our sights too low. When we aim for growth, we settle for knowledge. And knowledge is essential. Jesus, after all, in his great commission said, go and teach, right? We must learn the gospel story, mastering everything that God has revealed to us. But we should not just learn facts and stories, but we need to be mastered by the story of the gospel so that it becomes our story. Knowledge is essential, but it's not enough. Sometimes we settle for outward markers, that show that we take God seriously, such as church attendance or moral behavior. Obedience, like knowledge, is important. Again, in the Great Commission, teaching them all these things so that they would observe everything I've commanded you. Both teaching and knowledge 
And obedience is essential, but that's not enough. The real goal of us growing, the real goal of us maturing in our faith is that our hearts are changed so that we would love God more than anything or anyone else and love the things that he loves. And when the Pharisee comes in Matthew 22 and he asks Jesus, hey, which of these 613 commands is the most important? Jesus answers with a commandment that speaks to our desires. He says, you shall love the Lord with all your heart, with your soul, with your mind. Jesus clears all the clutter and he gets right to the heart. He's not negating all the commandments. He says all the commandments matter, but none matters more than this. Your desire needs to be for God. Your desire needs to be for God, to love God, to love people. If you do these things, then keeping the rest of the commandments is not a problem. Change must take place at the level of what we love and what we want. Friends, God wants nothing less than to change our hearts. He doesn't want us to think differently or behave differently. He wants us to want differently because he understands that our behavior and our thoughts flow from our desires. And in the end, this is the goal of growth. Love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. That's what it means to grow. This is what it means to love God with all your heart, to turn toward him to trust from one degree of glory to the next that he is shaping us. This isn't permission to stay in sin. This is a reminder that to turn toward him and not away from him and behold him and behold him shape and as he shapes us as we're slowly and slowly become like him. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've experienced this. And then God moves from the heart to the soul. And when the Bible says to love the Lord with all your soul, it's talking about our consciousness or what psychologists would call our self or our true self. The reality is in this room, we're all different types of personalities with different backgrounds. And there are all different kinds of tools out there that we can use to learn about ourselves. And maybe you're into the Enneagram, right? And you're like, I'm a four with a nine wing or whatever that means. Or you're, you're into that animal stuff, right? I'm a lion or I'm a golden retriever or I'm a monkey or remember that marriage mentoring thing that we did? I'm a, uh, what was it? A beaver, right? Um, or a lion and or a, I'm an INFP or ABCD. I don't know what it is. And um, we have all ways of measuring, all right? We had the SOI test and strength finders test and there's all sorts of stuff. And if you ask me, like when this has become my common theme, hey, what are you? I just say, I'm just jacked up completely, right? That's because I have no idea what I am. Um, the truth is, regardless of our personality, regardless of our background, God has created each of us to reflect his beauty, to reflect his grace. It doesn't matter what your personality is. You were designed to reflect God's glory. You were designed to reflect God's grace. To love the Lord with all your heart leads to loving him with all your soul, your consciousness, yourself. How does that work? See, the reason we fail to reflect God is because we have our own agenda, our own desires, our own ways of wanting to live our lives. But as we turn to him, as we gaze on him, as we delight in him, as we begin to look on him, we begin to be conformed. And as we're conformed, what happens is that my desires start becoming his desires. What he loves, I start to love. What he hates, I start to hate. And lastly, he moves from our hearts to our souls to our mind. The mind is the part that informs our heart and soul about what's true. This is why the Bible and knowing the Bible is such a big thing because the Bible is telling us what's true about God and what's true about us. If we want to see and marvel at and behold so that we will be transformed from one degree of glory to the next, it becomes key that you and I understand and know who God is. And the only way you can know who God is is to go back to the book. Listen, your feeling about God is irrelevant. And more than likely, your feeling about God is wrong. 
We have this tendency to make God like an ideal version of ourselves. That's you being God, not God being God. God is going to confront you with himself in his book. He's going to be on repeat saying, it is not about you, it's about me. God is going to be about God, and the Bible is going to say from beginning to the end that God is big, that God is beautiful, that God is powerful, that God is gracious, that God is able. And every time we go to the book, he is lifting up our eyes from our own weaknesses and failures and building into us the confidence that we cannot fail, we will not fail, and that his love is sure because we have been bought by the blood of Jesus. This is what's happening, but this involves getting our minds and not just our emotions into the game. I don't know about you, my emotions have failed me many, many times. There are many times where I feel like, God will never approve of me. God would never accept me. And I have to go back to Scripture to remind myself, my emotions are lying. This word is true. It says I've been bought by the blood of Jesus. It doesn't matter how I feel right now because my feelings will come and go. This word doesn't change. I need to build my life on his word. Emotions are an incredible gift from God, and we're not to be afraid of emotion. Emotions are a good thing. But friends, you cannot be ruled by emotions. Emotions often lie. They don't always lie, but they often lie. We are people of the book. And what that means is to be sanctified over an extended period of times of highs and lows, successes and failures, to give ourselves where we are as best, no, to fully loving God as a whole person, heart, soul, mind. Friends, our view of growth is too small. We think about learning, or learning more things, or changing behavior. Growth isn't less than that, but it's so much more. God wants to restore us. God wants to give us joy. God wants to make us the happiest people out there. The happiest people who, because they're pursuing Jesus, also end up being the holiest people. He wants to change our desires. Our plan for growth must take this into account. If we only needed to learn, we could simply go to a class or read a book. If we only needed to change a behavior, we could apply behavior modification techniques or try to build up enough willpower. We'd be frustrated, though, because we would never be able to learn enough or manage our behavior well enough that we would be satisfied. We need more than knowledge. We need more than behavior change. We need our hearts changed. And God in his word has given us exactly what we need. In Jesus, not only do we have a new heart, but we also have the power to change because when we came to Jesus, he now indwells us by the power of his spirit. Friends, God cares about every aspect of your lives, your bodies, your work, your families, your relationships. All of it matters to Jesus. And growing in our walk with Jesus means bringing all of it under his submission. It's not just what you do here. It's saying, God, all of my life belongs to you. All of it. Take it. Transform me. Make me into what you've called me to be. He doesn't want to just make you more serious or more otherworldly. He wants you to flourish. He wants, to become, he wants you to be more joyful in your humanity. He wants to change us at the deepest levels so we don't just think and act differently, but that we would want differently. This whole life, robust, heart-shaping, eternity-encompassing view of growth is compelling. And I pray that you would find that compelling as well. Let's not, as followers of Jesus, settle for anything less. Let's set our hearts and our minds and our goals on becoming who God wants us to be by his grace and through his strength. I mentioned earlier we're not able to do this on our own, but the moment we came to Jesus, he fills us with his Holy Spirit so that we have the power to change. And the only reason that Jesus can live inside of you and I because 2,000 years ago, 
on a hill outside the city of Jerusalem, the perfect Son of God willingly gave his life as a ransom for your sins and my sins so that we could be forgiven and accepted in what the New Testament says now our bodies have become the temple of the Holy Spirit. The only reason we have that opportunity is because Jesus gave his life for us. And as we come to communion this morning, as we desire to grow into what God wants us to be, we cannot grow if we get our eyes off the cross. We need to be constantly reminded that this isn't our work, this is his work, this is what he's done, and this is what he started. And the word says that what he started, he also will finish. There will be highs, there will be lows, but if he's called you, he's faithful. So as you come to the table this morning, would you be reminded of a faithful God who wants to change your joy, he wants to change your desires, he wants to change you so that you would grow to be the person that God desires for you. I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward. I'm going to invite you to examine your hearts, your minds. Are you busy trying to do more so that you can get God's approval? Are you art in love with Jesus? Are you loving God? Are you caught up in, man, am I doing enough? Am I doing enough? Am I doing enough? so that God will accept me and that God won't send me to hell? Or are you so captured by the cross and what Jesus did that you just say, man, Jesus, I just want to love you and serve you and follow you the rest of my life? I can't answer that for you, but you can. Would you examine your heart, your attitude, your affections? Would you come to the table celebrating the fact that Jesus has redeemed you, has saved you? The way we do communion here in a moment, the worship team's going to sing, Whenever you're ready, I'm going to invite you to come down the middle aisles, grab the elements, and then go down the side aisles um, and just spend some time with Jesus, worship, and then come for communion. If you want prayer this morning, Dominique and Roman are in the back, and they would love to pray with you. So if you have any need, requests, anything that you just want someone to pray with, they're available in the back. I invite you to go meet with them, pray with them. Let's worship Jesus.